So in my extensive research by Googling Kate Jeffrey CV, <laughs> I saw that you um, actually started off as a medical doctor or you, at least you did medical training mm -hmm. um, before you did your PhD. And I was just curious, how did you, uh, how did Kate Jeffries in the late 80s um, in New Zealand as a medical student end up? Uh, early 80s, uh, I have to say. <laughs> oh, early 80s. Um, Giving oh, sorry, 80 to 85, yeah. yeah. Um, but how did you end up as a medical student in New Zealand, then a few years later as a PhD student in Edinburgh working on, I don't know whether it was memory or spatial navigation, but... Yeah, I was, I was working on um, synaptic plasticity. Yeah, so it was a slightly circuitous route because I started, um, I started my scientific career doing medicine because I didn't think I could be a scientist. So I grew up in Dunedin, which is this little city in the far side of the world. And um, my father was a surgeon and, you know, all of their friends were medical and none of us knew any scientists. And it wasn't, it wasn't a career that really seemed viable in that environment. Um, so when I was trying to decide what to do with my life, I thought, well, I'll do medicine because it's scientific and I know it's employable. <laughs> and, you know, I was very steeped in the medical world and I said, it was very familiar and interesting. And so I studied medicine, but I always kind of knew that I wasn't very practically minded and I was head in the clouds, intellectual type, absent-minded professor type, even as a medical student. Yeah. And, you know, I was reading lots of stuff that wasn't really related to it medicine and when we had to in third year we had to do a project for our behavioral science course and most people did normal projects that a medical student would do looking at you know studying people's behavior or their you know, attitudes to illness or this that and the other I um, decided to research information theory um, which was this concept that I'd stumbled upon <laughs> and um, and so I learned all about um, the sort of the theory of communication. So um, Claude Shannon back in the 1940s laid out this sort of theory of how information um, could be contained in, in certain sort of formats and transmitted. And that, that sort of basically leads on to the brain and neurons and how neurons transmit information. And I thought, this is, this is kind of interesting. And then I came across this book by Douglas Hofstadter, who is a cognitive scientist who has thought a lot about the mind and how the mind is generated from neurons and, and you know these these kind of simple units which in and of themselves don't have minds but when you put them together they can generate minds and so on he wrote this book called Gödel Escher Bach which is about two and a half inches thick it's a, it's a weighty tome <laughs> and I started reading this book and I, I sort of took it with me one holiday I was going hitchhiking around the South Island of New Zealand with my flatmate and I brought this book with me to fill in the long hours sitting on the side of the road <laughs> in the baking sunshine with our thumbs out waiting for a car to come along. Or, you know, much of it, I, I remember sitting in a tent on this very uh, sort of deserted beach on the west coast of the South Island, which is just this incredible location to be thinking about the mysteries of the mind. And I read the entire book from start to finish, and I just thought this is the coolest thing I've ever come across, this idea that the mind is just a product of these um, physical processes. And how does that happen? How can you make a mind? You know? And so, so it sort of started from there. I then went, you know, went back to the hospital and finished my training and so on, but it was kind of preying on me that really I wanted to be studying this other stuff. And I thought, how do I do that? And so I decided to do um, a master's degree and see whether research is the type of thing that actually I, I could do. So by now I had a degree and I knew that I could pay the bills if I ever needed to, if I you know, were doing medicine, but I thought I'd, I'll try my hand um, at, at scientific research. And so I went to the, the only neuroscientists I knew of, which were in my hometown of Dunedin, where I had done my um, the first part of my medical training. And I discovered that in the psychology department was this very young and energetic new professor called Graham Goddard, who was studying this structure in the brain called the hippocampus, which I had dimly come across but didn't really know anything about. And he was interested in the way that the connections in hippocampal neurons can change in strength. And he said, yeah, why don't you join my lab for a year and you can do a project and see how you like research. And I was super excited because I thought this is my chance to really study the brain. 
Um, and I thought, okay, well, first of all, I'm going to finish the plan I had already formed, which is go to England for a year and just, you know, do. So young New Zealanders will often, um, at the start of their adult lives, they'll go and spend some time overseas. It's called getting your OE, your overseas experience. And then they'll go back to New Zealand. <laughs> um, I thought, okay, I want to do my OE. So I'll go to London. So I'll, I'll spend this year in London and then I'll come back and I'll do my master's with Graham Goddard. And just before I went to London, I went hiking with some friends in the mountains of the South Island, which is a very, very rugged, inhospitable um, kind of countryside, very steep, jagged mountains, very, very high, quite dangerous. And while we were in these mountains, like days from anywhere, um, we were caught up in this big storm and we spent a night huddled in our tents. In fact, it made maybe more than one night huddled in our tents with the rain lashing down and the wind and you know, the rumblings of rocks and the mountains above us. And, you know, I thought we were going to die. And then the rain cleared and we kind of staggered out and went to Queenstown, which was the nearest town to where we were. Um, you know, staggered into the nearest cafe, bought a coffee, a newspaper, sat down, thought, whew, you know, we made it. Opened the newspaper and there were, on the front page was this story of a neuroscientist who had been caught in the storm while out hiking with his family and had been swept away in a river and drowned. And it was my would-be supervisor, Graham Goddard, and I was absolutely um, devastated. Um, it was a terrible, terrible tragedy. Um, and he left behind you know, a wife and young child and also all, you know, shattered dreams <laughs> of all of the people who were working <laughs> yeah. with him and so on. Um, so, I, so I went to London and I, I did my OE. While I was there, I got a, um, a letter. So in those days, there was no email. So it was a typed letter from Cliff Abraham who was a colleague of Graham Goddard's. And he said, look, I remember when you came to visit and um, I remember that you wanted to come and do a master's. So that offer is still open. You can come and work in my lab. I'm working on this um, phenomenon also in the hippocampus called LTP, which we think is how memories are made. And I thought, oh, that, that sounds great. So maybe I can, you know, maybe my plan hasn't turned to dust at all. And he also said, while you're in London, you should go and visit John O'Keefe. Um, who was working on hippocampus. Uh, he's kind of an interesting guy. Yeah. And so I went to visit John O'Keefe. And at that stage, I was, um, I was experimenting with um, the 80s fashions, which I don't know if you know the 80s fashions. <laughs> uh, but not if much. You, was that the shoulder if you, pads? Oh, if you, it, was, it was spiky dyed hair, uh, okay. Doc Martens. So, so I went to visit John O'Keefe with orange spiky dyed hair and um, Doc Martens that laced all the way up my my legs. I don't know what he thought of me, um, and sort of said, "Yeah, I'm kind of interested in the brain. I sort of want to want to figure out how it works." Um, and he was very sort of kind, and he told me all about these cells he'd discovered called place cells. And I thought oh, that seems kind of interesting, and I sort of filed that away. So then I went back to New Zealand, and I did do my masters with Cliff Abraham, and I learned about LTP, which is um, this way in which neurons, if they're kind of active together, then they will strengthen the connection between them. So this was an idea that was developed by Hebb, who um, was working in McGill, and um, some of his students um, back in those days in McGill included John O'Keefe and also Graham Goddard, and you know, so this all <laughs> tangled web of, of interconnections. So I um, so I did my masters on LTP, and I was sort of looking at um, how it correlates with the with the duration of memories and. At the end of that, I thought, this is, this is neat. I actually really love research. I want to keep doing this. Um, so what do I do next? And I was going to try and do a PhD also with Cliff. So I was going to carry on my, my master's work. But um, the New Zealand Medical Research Council, which was really the only route for funding, ran out of money that year. They said, sorry, we can't fund anything. <laughs> so this is, you know, this is my, my instinct that New Zealand was not a great place to do science was, yeah. was kind of born out by that experience. Um, so they, they said, you haven't got the funding, sorry. Um, so I thought, what am I going to do? And I came across an advertisement by um, this, this um, scientist in Edinburgh called Richard Morris, who I knew of because he was very famous in the field of LTP. And he had been trying to link it to learning. So I'd read all his papers and I thought, you know, he's a famous guy. So I wrote to him and said, look, I know you're advertising for a postdoc and I don't actually have my PhD yet, but I do have a medical degree and I really want to come and work with you. And amazingly, he took me on, sight unseen. 
So I traveled to Edinburgh and I did my PhD with him and uh, learned all about LTP. And while I was there, I had the opportunity to visit John O'Keefe's lab again, this time now knowing something about the area. And I discovered place cells and I thought, you know, LTP is interesting, but place cells are amazing. I want to study place cells. And that was the beginning of the rest of my career, basically. <laughs> that was a much more interesting answer than I expected. <laughs> Sorry, it <laughs> I was thought a bit it was long gonna, No, no, but that was great. I thought it was going to be something like, well, you know, I did medicine, I didn't really want to do it. So I thought, well, I'll just, yeah. you know. You did say you could edit this down, right? And you did say I could wander no, off I, track I'll, and it doesn't matter. I'll keep this, though. That was great. <laughs> I also didn't know that you'd already met John O'Keefe before even doing your master. I mean, no, that was really fascinating. Um, I like one question I uh, also wanted to ask, which you kind of already answered, is... Um, whether Richard Morris was already as famous as he was, because I mean, this is a general point. I'll, you know, I learned, started learning about this stuff 2014. I took Neil Burgess's course, literally three weeks in. John O'Keefe won the Nobel Prize, so like I know that this is big stuff, right? right? Like this is this is how I got to know it as something like this is really famous, really cool research. But I was. One question I wanted to ask, like whether, for example, Richard Morris, who was always spoken of very highly in Neil Wages' course, was already famous then. But I, I think you already answered that question, right? He, yes, I, I, he was. So by that stage, so this was the um, early. So 1990 was the year that I arrived in Edinburgh, and by that stage, his water maze task was becoming quite widely accepted as the way to measure hippocampal function because the water maze task requires navigation. So I don't know if your listeners will know about the watermost task, but basically the idea is that you put um, a rat in a swimming pool about two meters across and it um, it swims around until it stumbles on a on a platform that it can climb onto. And it can't see the platform because the surface is just below the surface of the water, but it can climb onto it and rest and shake itself down and so on and so on. And the only way that the, the rat knows where the platform is, is by looking at the landmarks that it can see in the room, in the outside room, because there's nothing in the pool that marks the location of the platform. So it's really a fairly pure test of the ability of animals to, to kind of integrate um, a variety of spatial cues that are in different locations and use that to pinpoint a location that in itself isn't marked. And it turns out to be extremely sensitive to damage to the hippocampus. So the landmark study that Richard Morris did with John O'Keefe was to lesion the hippocampus and show that, um, no, sorry, actually that predated um, his work with John O'Keefe. So he showed that if you lesion the hippocampus, then the animals are um, very impaired at finding water maze platform. And then he collaborated with John O'Keefe and they looked at what happens if you block LTP. So this memory mechanism that I had been studying um, with, with Cliff Abraham. Um, if, you, if you put into the brain a drug that blocks that process and stops these connections um, between neurons forming, if you put that drug into the hippocampus, then you stop the animals being able to find that um, hidden platform. So this was all kind of coming together to suggest that the hippocampus has got something to do with with um, processing spatial information, so spatial mapping of some sort. So, I mean, he became a lot more famous after that because he then went on to do a lot of very elegant work linking the spatial processing with episodic memory, so memory for life events. And um, he did some... Very, I mean, he's known for his very clever experimental designs and and also for his development of, of quite clever methods for finding out what animals know. Um, so he's really a very skilled uh, behavioral neuroscientist, so both on the behavior side and the neuroscience side. So he was tremendously influential. And on in, in that line, I mean, again, when I first learned about this, in hindsight, this was all very famous and well known and very cool. But were place cells? Um, I mean, so 1990, I guess when you started, was quite a bit before grid cells were found, and around the time that the head direction cells were found, right? I think that was That's like right. late 80s or something. Yes. So, but was this already like as much of a like? Was there as much hype behind the few, or was it just like a few random people doing these things, and people didn't quite realize how important it was going to be? Yeah, I think it was the the beginning. I mean, it's been a sort of an exponential rise, I guess. So, f so play the first paper on place cells was published in 1971, and throughout the 70s, um, it was really only John O'Keefe who was um, studying these things, and and the papers were 
um, fairly widely spaced in time and not widely accepted. So a lot of people felt, so place cells, you know, are these neurons, single neurons in the hippocampus that become active when the rat goes to a particular place in the environment. And O'Keefe had stumbled on them, um, I think, sort of by accident when he was looking for um, the role of the hippocampus in memory. So we knew at that stage, so back in the 1970s, we knew that damage to the hippocampus produces really profound impairments in episodic memory. And we knew that from human studies. And so the neuroscience community was trying to find a correlate of that in animals so that we could study this, you know, the, the contribution neurobiologically. So Jim Ronk in the US developed a method for recording single neurons in awake behaving animals. And this involved flexible microwires. That they could move around, right? That was the was that the novel part that they could actually move rather than Yes, that's right. So so up until that time when people had wanted to record individual neurons, the animals had to be anesthetized and immobilized and the and the electrodes were rigid, sort of glass or tungsten or something like that. So quite stiff. And um those electrodes turn out not to work very well if the animal can move around because um, they're so rigid that the the tiny movements of the brain as the animal is moving just um, dislodge the electrode relative to the neuron. You, you can't um, you can't record the same neuron. Whereas with flexible microwires, they kind of are flexible enough to get carried along with the brain as it's moving, so they're much more stable. So that was quite a revolutionary technology and. Um, O'Keefe learned about this technique from from Ronk, and um, when he set up his new lab in London, he started using this, this technique to record these hippocampal neurons. And that was when he observed that the neurons would often become active when the animal went to a particular place in the environment. And he called these neurons place cells. But it it took a long time for people to accept that characterization of them because because place is quite an abstract concept. And at that stage, people were still thinking of the um, the brain as a pretty mechanistic device that associates inputs and outputs with not too much other stuff in the middle. So um, this was an idea that had developed in psychology in the early 19... So the early 20th century, so the early 1900s. Um, this idea that the, the brain is basically forming connections between what goes in and what comes out. So it's it's an associative network. And the the way of studying that behaviorally was a discipline in psychology known as behaviorism. Um, and in its strongest form, behaviorism claims that um, that there are no processes that are not visible in the behavior of the animal. So there's no kind of black box processing going on somewhere in the brain. Um, it's all fairly straightforward connections between what goes in and what comes out. And um, behaviorists the strong form of behaviorism would claim that all animal behavior and all knowledge and all thinking could be explained with this pretty flat associative network. So the idea that a neuron could be responding to something really abstract like place um, as opposed to some sensory stimulus like being able to see that you know, door over there or that window or, or something like that, um, it was just a bit too far from the associative behaviorist notion and, and so it wasn't well accepted. And so O'Keefe was challenged a lot. You know, how do you know that the animal can't just smell some, there's some spot on the surface that it's walking around on? And so he had to do a lot of work, um, a lot of control conditions, you know, showing that the place cell would still fire in the same place if you change the floor paper or if you replace the box with a different box that looks exactly the same or, um, or if you move the entire box a, few, a couple of inches to one side, uh, everything, you know, the place cells firing would shift a couple of inches as well. So it was it, it couldn't really be explained by simple sensory inputs um but you know slowly the the um evidence accumulated and more and more people started to um to pick it up and to start to characterize the type of information that the cells use so throughout the 1980s and the 1990s a lot of experiments were done and not just by O'Keefe but by other people too so that that also made it more acceptable people were replicating the findings and and seeing the same phenomena in multiple labs, so that became more convincing. Um, and and finding things like you know you can show that a place cell, if you if you have a fairly simple symmetric environment like a cylinder with a single cue card, you know it's just a white piece of cardboard on the wall or something. If you take the animal out of that environment, move the 
card around to a different part of the wall and then put the animal back, then the place cell will shift its firing to follow that, that rotated cue. So that tells you that the cell is getting some type of information from that visual cue. And so, you know, lots of, lots of experiments came along um, showing how the cells are processing sensory information um, and showing that they are indeed extracting uh, this more abstract representation built up from the sensory information coming in. And one of the big insights was that the cells can combine static sensory information from the environment together with information about the animal's movements. So, for example, you can have a place cell in a cylinder and it fires in a particular place. Every time the rat goes there, it'll become active. And you know that that cell is responsive to a cue card because you know if you take the animal out and rotate the cue card around and you put the animal back in, you know the cell will have rotated its firing. So definitely it's getting this visual uh, input. But you can also turn out the lights. So now the animal can't see the cue card anymore, but the place cell will still fire in that same place. And it will um, do so for quite a long time. And the reason is that the brain can substitute, like while it's for that period of time while it's missing the visual inputs, it can use the self-motion tracking system in the brain to update its calculation of where the animal is. So even though the animal can't see the cue card at this particular moment, the sense of direction, for example, is, has still maintained the, its tracking of which way the animal is facing. And it can do that for quite a few minutes. And then when the lights come back on and the animal can see the cue card again, if the sense of direction had gotten a little bit out of alignment, it adjusts itself once the animal can see the cue card and it's, it switches back. So, so you can kind of switch back and forth between the internal sense of direction and the external visual landmark. And that, you know, again, that, that, that tells us that what the cells are processing is to do with these spatial characteristics, place and direction. Um, it's more than just raw sensory information. What paper is that with uh, turning the lights off? There are there are a few papers. Um, so as a, sorry, the reason I'm asking is also that I always put like papers we talk about. I put in the description of the I put the references in the description of the episode. So and I actually don't know that paper. Yeah, yeah. There are there are um, there are sort of several looking at what happens. Some are looking at the head direction system, and some are looking at um, at place self firing, and then there's the experiments that I did when I was in John O'Keefe's lab. So I went to, to work with John O'Keefe as a postdoc after my PhD with, with Richard Morris. And so one of the things that I was looking at is this interplay between um, what the animal can see and what its sense of direction is telling it. And so what I found was that, um, so you can do this experiment where you take the animal out, you rotate the cue card and put it back and, and the cells will rotate. But the other thing you can do is you can take the animal out, put it in a, in a little box very slowly turn the box around by, let's say, 180 degrees and put the animal back in the environment. And if there's no other conflict, so if you've taken the cue card away, so there's, not, there's nothing to um, tell the animal that it's wrong in its assessment of which way it's facing, the fact that you've turned the animal around 180 degrees will rotate the place fields by 180 degrees as well. So it's like the animal was carrying the direction of everything around in its head um, and then when you put the animal back in the environment, the place cells use that to establish their firing fields. And then I did some work sort of looking at what happens if there, there is in fact a conflict between the, what the animal can see and what its internal sense of direction tells it is where it thinks it's facing. And you can switch the trust in that system between the sense of direction and the visual cue card by teaching the animal that one or other of those things is not reliable. So for example, if you move the cue card so that the animal can see that it's moving, then the, the place cells learn, okay, we can't trust that cue card, it moves around. So it's not a very good uh, ind indicator for our sense of, you know, for our directional orientation. So we'll use the sense of direction of the, um, the rest of the brain instead. So you can actually see this dynamic updating and learning um, of the spatial system based on past experience. So it's quite a plastic system, and that's what we think all of that LTP stuff is for. It's for adjusting all of these connections and um, you know, helping the system adapt on the basis of experience. Yeah, and was that then, was, was that then your PhD, the relationship between LTP and place cells, or was it 
No, my PhD was um, it was looking at the relationship of so I, w- I was looking at water maze um, behavior because I was in in Richard's lab for that, and I was looking at the um, correlation in individual animals between how easy it is to, to to induce LTP and how well they learn the water maze task, and I found this quite good correlation between those two things. So there's a lot of individual variability in plasticity, and that was reflected in um, speed of and, and durability of spatial learning. But you know, when I then went to um, work in John's lab to look at place cells, I carried with me this sort of interest in plasticity and learning and how the, how the system learns and, and updates. And you know, I, I wasn't alone. Obviously, lots of it's a it's a very big area. Plasticity is you know tremendously important for forming memory, and it's, and it's a very big field. But I was sort of linking it to place cells, and um, it's still an interest of mine. Okay. Um, I have one very silly question. Uh, did Richard Morris refer to the Morris water maze as the Morris water maze? <laughs> um, no, I, I really want that to be the I, case. I don't think he did. I, uh, offhand, I think he referred to it as the water maze. Okay. Um, he, the water maze. Or... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody else calls it the, the Morris water maze. Exactly. Yeah, that's what yeah, I mean. Like, yeah. I've never heard anyone say anything other than the Morris water maze. Yeah, I don't think he used, yeah. used that. Uh, oh, that's a shame. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would just be great. <laughs> <laughs> I was very fortunate. You know, I also encountered Tim Bliss in my very early career. So when I was doing my master's um, degree with Cliff Abraham in New Zealand, we had a visit from Tim Bliss, and we were so he he knew Cliff very well. They were old friends um, because Cliff had worked sort of um, in Europe in the early part of his career. Um, and in fact, I hadn't really realized, but I was Cliff's first um, postgraduate student. I, I had no idea how young he was. To me, he was a sort of grandfatherly yeah, yeah. figure. You know? um, and so Tim um, visited Otago while I was there. And, and um, so we had quite a few scientific discussions and um, I kind of felt like I got to know him quite well. And so when I went to Edinburgh, I'm pretty sure actually that he put in a good word for me with Richard, and that was one of the reasons that Richard took me on sight unseen as a PhD student. But Tim um, examined my PhD thesis, so I was you know, tremendously privileged to have. So you know, he discovered LTP. I, I probably should say that because it's not necessarily something you know, but he he discovered um, LTP, and um, in fact he um, was working in um, McGill with Head. So he's another one of these connections. With, you know. Um, I'm not, actually, I can't remember if he worked with Heb or if it, if it was slightly after. But anyway, he was very influenced by Heb's ideas, and his idea was to try and see if he could see uh, this connectivity forming between neurons. And he didn't manage to do that for his PhD, so his PhD was sort of a failure. But when he went to visit Norway to visit his friend um, Terje Lomo, Lomo was studying um, neurons in Heb campus. And he he said to Bliss, look, you've got to you've got to look at this thing that I've found. I've, I found that when I stimulate these um, pathways into the dentate gyrus part of the hippocampus, when the preparation gets a bit tired at the end of the day, if I give this high frequency burst of pulses, then everything gets much stronger. And um, Bliss said, look, this is this is amazing. This is synaptic plasticity. This is what I've been trying to find in my PhD, and I was yeah. looking in the visual cortex, but here you found it in the hippocampus. So um, he and Lomo. Um, went to London and um, and got this working, and they published this paper, which has had possibly one of the one of the most highly cited papers in all of neuroscience, uh, reporting this phenomenon of LTP. Um, and L- LTP is it's now so well established that it's just that we just we just talk about LTP like every every neuroscience student knows what LTP is more or less without explanation. And so to have Tim Bliss come to New Zealand while I was there was this incredible privilege. And to have him examining my PhD was also this incredible privilege. And um, so when I started applying for jobs, I, was, I, I wrote to Tim and said, look, would you be one of my referees along with Richard Morris and John O'Keefe? So I had these three <laughs> luminaries. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty referees. good list of references. Yeah, I, and I, I didn't fully, I think, back then appreciate just how incredibly lucky I had been to just fall in to this this network of people who have just been pivotal um, in our understanding of this system. And, you know, looking yeah. back, this this little kid from New Zealand with, with big aspirations to, you know, do science, you know, I, I just can't believe how 
how it all turned out. Sometimes it's, it's amazing. So, yes. um, so yeah, so so that was that was how That's I got started. Really. Crazy the coincidences here. I mean, as just from meeting the people randomly and. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. Um, yeah, I think it does say something about the importance of networking and the importance of introducing young scientists to senior scientists in the field. And, you know, that we have sort of mechanisms for doing that, conferences and so on. And I think we need to remember as a discipline how important those opportunities are in shaping people's careers and inspiring them and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, one question I had about something you said earlier that, I mean, that Richard Morris offered you the PhD position without, I mean, did he literally just get that one letter from you or was, was there any more to it or was it just you wrote a letter, he said, okay, if you want to come. Just... Some, something like that. I mean, I, I mean, I think, you know, he, he must've, um, I mean, he knew Cliff Abraham, who's a well-respected figure. And, and um, like I say, I think possibly Tim Bliss or he possibly also, asked him or Tim said something or, or something like that. But, you know, in those days, I mean, I was in New Zealand and, and Richard was in Edinburgh. I wasn't going to fly fly over for an interview. Um, we didn't have Zoom. We didn't, you know, we had telephones. I think we possibly had That would have probably cost a fortune, right? Yeah, it did. Yeah. And, and you know, um, so it was it was definitely not the um, hoops that we make postdocs and PhD students jump through these days to get positions. Yeah, I wanted to ask, like, whether that's, do you think that's a good system i mean like because now it's a thing where you have to you know hand in all these things your cv you meet the people you have interviews you have several letters of recommendation etc cetera, etc cetera. <laughs> um i mean what do you think are the advantages disadvantages of either system well i mean the system that we have now i mean to be honest i think there's possibly still quite a lot of word of mouth um happens and networking and and you know that type of thing which is great in some ways because it means you know if you've if you've come across a really bright student um and you know you know a colleague who's looking for someone um and you can put those two um, people together you know in, in some ways that's really great but on the other hand it, it um it does mean that you have this system where you're drawing a line between the the privileged people who are who have contact with those networks and the less privileged people who haven't so um it's fine if you are uh, if you stumble on a network and I, you know, I was in some ways quite privileged because although I was in New Zealand, um, I was in medicine. So, you know, that gives you some credibility. And, um, you know, I was in a sort of local network. If you've got somebody who's coming from, you know, somewhere in South America and hasn't really had the opportunity because of geographical distance, for example, to meet all of these people and get plugged into that network, um, those types of people get left out. And the thing about the system where you advertise widely and you have shortlists and, you know, all of that kind of stuff, although it's a bit more tedious administratively, I feel it's a bit fairer. So I think I think we do need to kind of modernize, modernize a bit. But there's always a, a place for networking because there's, you know, one-to-one -one interactions can be very inspiring. And I mean, also, obviously, an interview is not, you know, a letter of recommendation or someone saying, uh, hey, this person is really, like this person has done research with me and is really good, is worth a lot more than someone answering 10 questions well in an interview. Right? Yeah. They're, they're just completely separate different situations doing research and doing an interview. So in some sense, it also, yeah, it does make a lot more sense. Yeah, it also allows for things like, you know, this person um, didn't manage to get any publications from their PhD, let's say, but the supervisor is that, you know, maybe bumps into someone at a conference or something and says, I've got this really amazing student. Unfortunately, they've not published anything. So their CV doesn't look great, but this, you know, this person is super smart and extremely talented and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the the word of mouth thing also has some benefits. I, I don't really know what the answer is to the correct balance yeah, between yeah. those things. <laughs> yes. um, <laughs> I don't know if there is one. It's, yeah. it's always difficult, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I wasn't expecting you to solve the problem here yeah. now. <laughs> uh, if you don't mind i'd like to ask a bit more a little bit about the like history of the whole of the field almost and uh one way in which we can maybe do this is that um a while ago you tweeted a tweet about uh something that happened in the 90s um so so the date that you tweeted about is the 12th of april 1994 
<laughs> I don't know whether... So yeah, there know, are two things you... that seem to happen on that day. The first is I celebrated my third birthday. Um, <laughs> not actually that too far from UCL. So old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> but um, so that's one thing that happened. Another thing that happened is so um, I think I just described the tweet and everything. You can explain what what, what the significance behind it is. So the tweet is a photo of a. It seems to be like a piece of like A4 paper onto which is with like yellow adhesive tape, you kind of, not glued, but would you say glued to it? Cell uh, yeah. Yeah, tape, yeah. Yeah, sellotape to it. A small squ white square of paper, basically. And on that white square of paper are lots of black dots or black and white checkered dots. And those dots seem to... They kind of cluster, so they're, they're kind of they're not randomly on this on the square, but they seem to kind of cluster in three different points towards the top left, top right, and kind of towards the middle of the uh, center of the bottom. And on the there's you can see it says place cell um, uh, at the top of it or to the left of it. And then your your tweet is uh, sometimes when I'm feeling wistful, I like to take this out, look at it, and cry. <laughs> from medial entorhinal cortex 12th of april 1994 so would you like to elaborate on why this makes you cry <laughs> <laughs> sure yes so um so i went to um john o'keefe's lab as a postdoc in 1993 um so i was just finishing up my phd with richard and then i moved and i was interested in place cells so I discovered you know place cells when I'd visited John John's lab and thought I want I want to study these um, these cells and John had this very accommodating attitude which was when people come to my lab they can study whatever they like basically um, so which was nice in some ways but it just kind of leaves you wide open to um, how, why, how do I figure out what to study and so I thought well what's the question about place cells the question is how does a place cell know where to fire so in a place cell you know, when, it, when the rat goes to a place in the environment and the cell becomes really active and fires all these action potentials, how does it know to do that? It's just a cell in the brain. It's just got other, it's just other action potentials coming in and so on. Um, so what we really need to do is to record from the inputs to that region and find out what are they doing. And one of the big inputs to the place cell region in the hippocampus is this region called entorhinal cortex. And it's a part of the cortex that is connected to quite a few other parts of the brain. So the cortex is the sort of outer part of the, the brain. So the, the entorhinal cortex is getting inputs from the visual part of the brain and the auditory part of the brain and all, all sorts of regions and, and kind of funneling this information into the place cells. So I thought I'm going to try recording from, from this region. And it's really difficult to get to because in the rat, it's right down the sides of the brain. It's very inaccessible. And I spent quite a lot of time trying to figure out how to get electrodes um, in there in a way that I could record. So what exactly is the difficulty? If it's so the, the difficulty sides, is because, or, yeah. um, because it's around the side. So if you're recording from the hippocampus, which is um, at the top of the brain, you can make a hole in the skull. So you anesthetize the, the rat, um, make a little hole in the skull and just put your electrodes in and, and seal everything up and let, let it all heal up. If it's around the side of the brain, the skull is much thicker and it's really hard to reach. Uh -huh. It's behind the okay. ears and all sorts of things. And you can't just, and because it's at the side, you can't just stick an electrode in. So I ended up having to go in from the top and angle the electrodes in this sort of quite difficult way. It took a bit of fiddling to, to get it to work, and it didn't always work. So I was just sort of starting to um, to get this to work. And, and then when I did get my electrodes into what seemed to be the entorhinal cortex, I, I just saw lots of sort of stuff happening, and it was quite hard to figure out what was going on. Lots of cells that were just active all over the place. I did see quite a lot of cells that had a lot of rhythmic activity. And so I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. Um, and I, every now and then I would see a cell that seemed to have some sort of spatial activity. So its action potentials weren't distributed all over the environment. They would be sort of in clusters like, like with place cells. And occasionally I, there would be multiple clusters. And so uh, what that piece of paper shows you that was in the tweet is one of these cells that I found um, – and it was a recording that I'd made that showed that there were, seemed to be these three locations in the environment where this cell would become more active. And so I kind of looked at that and thought, well, this is sort of like a place cell, but messier, you know. Um, and I saw a few of these things, but not very many. And meanwhile, I saw lots of these rhythmic cells and, um, and they, they had some interesting properties. Um, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll just I'll 
kind of write up a little paper on those and then I'll kind of move on because I, I don't really have a handle <laughs> on what's going on here. So while, while I was in that phase of my experiments, these two people came to visit the lab called um, Edvard and Maybrit Moser. And they had been uh, doing their PhD in Trondheim um, in Norway um, with Per Andersen, who's one of these kind of luminary figures in, in um, LTP and plasticity and, and so on. And they had been working on plasticity. So I, so I knew them. In fact, when I had been doing my PhD in Richard's lab, they'd come to Richard's lab. So I'd met them and I, I kind of knew them and knew that they were, they were um, very super smart and super energetic. So we met again when they came to Richard's lab and they spent six months there. And, and my job and that of my husband, um, Jim, was to teach them how to record place cells. So we taught them how to record place cells. And um, Jim was an engineer, in fact, and he, um, he had developed, together with a technician in the lab, Clive Parker, he, um, he and Clive had built this new recording sort of system. And so the Moses said, okay, so we think place cells are really cool. We want to study these. And we like this system. It's a really nice recording system. It's using this new digital signal processing technology. So it's much smaller than previous recording systems. And you could record lots and lots of channels and so on and so on. Um, can we buy one of your systems? So, so Jim actually formed a company and, and uh, that company sold them a, a system. And they went back to Trondheim and started recording, you know, doing the thing that was, that was the obvious thing to do, which was to record from the region of the brain that's sending all these projections to the place cells. And they were collaborating with Menno Witter, who's this very talented anatomist. And he said, yes, entorhinal cortex um, is where you want to go. And this is the exact region of entorhinal cortex where you should go if you want to find out who's talking to the place cells. Oh, this yeah, little yeah, region yeah. here. So they put their electrodes um, in that little region there. And this was um, experiments done by Mariana Fern and Torkel Hafting, who were two PhD students in the lab. So I, I um, met Mariana Fern and Torkel Hafting at the Society for Neuroscience meeting in 1994. And they had a poster showing that when they recorded from this little region of entorhinal cortex, they saw these multiple regions of activity. And they then published this really nice paper in science and, and um Oh, hang on. No, it couldn't be 1994. It was later. I was about it was to 2004. Ask. Sorry, Wasn't I've got my that. decades wrong. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. 2004. They, so they'd spent 10 years sort of getting this to work and um, recording these neurons. I mean, they did lots of other stuff in that 10 years as well. It was an amazing golden decade for that lab. Um, but anyway, they had this, this poster in 2004, um, and they had these uh, entorhinal cells with these multiple regions of, of activity. So it was clearly something spatial going on, and they published this nice paper in Science showing this. And then in 2005, the bombshell paper came out, and this was a recording from the same brain region, but in a much larger environment. So what had happened was they and other people, um, including Bill Skaggs, who's a theoretical neuroscientist, had looked at the sort of pattern of you know blobs um, and said, look, it looks like these regions where these entorhinal cells are firing are not randomly distributed. So although there are multiple regions in the environment, they're not like random multiple regions as if you're recording several place cells at once. For one thing, the regions are all really circular, unlike with place cells where the regions are often quite elongated or you know, quite irregular. These are very regular. Um, and also the spacing between them is very even, and it looks like it's non-random. So to get a handle on this, the, the, uh, the Moses, so Mariana and Torkel, uh, recorded in a very large environment, two meters by two meters, so a huge environment for a rat. And sure enough, they found this very regular pattern where the uh, locations where these cells fire, so what's called the firing fields, evenly spaced and arranged in these really neat rows that look like, um, look like a grid pattern. So they called these cells grid cells. And I remember when I saw the paper of grid cells, it was one of those jaw-dropping, you know, flashbulb memories for me. I remember where I was, you know, <laughs> um, and so on and so on. And, you know, it was just an, an extraordinary finding. Um, and the reason it was extraordinary is that the regularity of the pattern cannot come from the environment. There's nothing in the environment that has this, you know, regularity. It's, an, it's purely internally generated. And yet it also um, comes about because of the environment. So it's an interaction between something that's going on in the rat's head and something that's happening out there in the world. And it, it's really you know, an, an incredible discovery. So um, I realized in retrospect that my cell that I recorded in 1994 
was one of these cells. And so I, go, I, I, I dug out my you know, little bit of paper um, and I realized that it's a very characteristic you know, triangular pattern, three blobs yeah. evenly spaced. And I realized that for sure that was a grid cell. Um, and I'm not the only scientist to have done that. Quite a few scientists who were kind of also asking these same questions. So Jim Kinnear and, and other people, um, if you talk to them, they'll say, yeah, we, we now realize we were seeing things like this too, but nobody put it together until the Moser paper. So that was just incredible. And, and you know, as you've mentioned, um, the Moses and O'Keefe together got the Nobel Prize a few years later for the joint discovery of grid cells and place cells. You know, also, I think a lot of us think uh, head direction cells should be in there as well. So head direction cells is, is kind of, the, I, I think of it as the third leg of the stool of, of spatial cells. But um, yeah, it was, it was certainly a very um, exciting decade to have been active in that area. Was, um, so one thing, I think after they won the Nobel Prize, I think Neil just wrote a review of the history of spatial navigation or something like that. And I think in that he mentioned that Minovita also suggested to the Moses to use a bigger box, I think, or, or what do you call it? Not box, but... Um, yeah, arena. Uh, arena, 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 yeah. Yes, I, I think arena. several people people did. So we had a, a journal club um, about the 2004 paper. Um, and I actually um, remember vividly that Tom Hartley, um, who had been working with Neil, so he did his, I think, postdoctoral work with Neil. And, and Tom said, I wonder if those, you know, blobs are, they, they look, you know, regular to me as well. And in fact, so, some of the um, people in my labs, uh, of which Caswell Barry was one, and Robin Heyman was another, um, and my, Michael Anderson, so so three people in the lab at the time, started trying to record interminal neurons too. So even before the grid cell paper was published, um, people were looking for something along those lines. Um, but Marianne and Torkel got there first. And and the the other thing I should mention is that the recording system that they made that discovery on was the recording system that Jim, my husband, had, had sold to them um, <laughs> when they were in the lab. And so that recording system now resides in the Nobel Museum in Stockholm. Oh, really? So that was a really nice kind of, you know, little connection for me. So although I didn't, you know, didn't get the Nobel Prize for discovering grid cells, I came so close, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we still, you know, as a team, we, we kind of in the Nobel Museum. But, you know, I, I don't, I don't, um, I, I, I pretend that I cry over that picture, but I, actually I don't um, begrudge them. Um, that discovery because the amount of work that went into actually making the discovery and not only not only discovering them but they also did an incredible amount of work to characterize these neurons and to figure out all the connections and it's just a an astonishingly beautiful piece of um, research it's just science at its absolute best and I you know I think it's an amazing you know one of the landmark discoveries of the century I think is the place cells and the grid cells for helping us understand how the mind comes about really yeah I mean, I'm also curious about the whole, I mean, like in, hind, in hindsight now, what you make of the data you recorded then and a kind of like potential reasons, kind of almost more to meta level, like of, you know, why you didn't find the pattern. Like, was it that you didn't have, you said earlier, you didn't have many spatial neurons. So were there just not enough spatial neurons for you to see the like triangular thing? Um, was that part of the problem or did you have different, I don't know, other arenas always kind of, were they always standard sized apart from those that were then bigger or? Yes. So, so we tended, so, I mean, something that, that I've kind of noticed a lot in science is that, um, that big discoveries get made when you just kind of do something, um, different from how it's normally done. <laughs> so normally we would record in a, you know, in a box that was small enough, that, that was big enough so that you could see these place fields. So a, play, a typical place field in a, in a rat might be like a few tens of centimeters across, or, or maybe even just a few centimeters okay. across. Okay. It depends. Sometimes some of them are big and some of them are small. Um, so, so there's a sort of trade-off. If you make the environment too large, then the, the rat gets tired and bored and um, full of rice <laughs> before it's kind of covered the environment densely enough for you to be able to see the, the pattern emerge clearly. Yeah. So this is this trade-off between getting good coverage, good even coverage, and get, getting big enough coverage. And, and so the trade-off is typically you have a, an environment that's about a meter. And it just turns out that um, the smallest grid, the smallest spacing between grid fields is about 30 centimeters. So in a meter-sized environment, you just don't see many of these. And we just never had seen enough of them. Um, 
for for the penny to drop, basically. But it, it emerged in a two meter environment. Then it became very obvious, and you know we, we now. If you want to record grid cells, usually you'd use a meter and a half or a two meter size box. Um, but it is hard work. It's hard to get coverage in a. In a I mean, they always throw around time. like food for the rats, so they just have some some reason for walking around, right? Is that yeah? Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Because you're trying to get the rat to do something that's a bit unnatural, because a normal rat would never spend all of its time in in the open like that. So you know, rats would normally follow quite stereotyped trajectories, you know, rat runs through the environment, and they would venture out into the open to grab something, but then they'd scuttle back to somewhere safe. And So, you know, what we're asking them to do to forage in this homogeneous way across a big open space is kind of unnatural. And um, it's also, you know, they, they end up eating quite a lot, <laughs> a few, <laughs> even a few try and, um, so, so typically we'll use rice or something like that, which has got a few calories and it tastes good, but, you know, we try not to fill them up too quickly. But even so, by the end of 20 minutes or 30 minutes, they're getting a bit full and they'll want to sit in a corner and groom and clean up a bit and perhaps have a nap, you know. So <laughs> that's the problem with behaving animals. You kind of have to work with the animal to some extent and um, bribe it to do things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but is there – so I'm trying to um, – I mean, you said earlier, like one – one way that people make big discoveries is by doing things differently than they were done before and trying to just kind of find some more, like some general principles, like from that experience of you seeing many people doing this thing or trying to do the similar thing and then it working only for one group. Is it just questioning the assumptions as in like, this is the arena um, or... Yeah, I'm just curious, like whether there's anything you particularly like learned from that experience that you use now in your research, or um, yes, I think one thing is sort of questioning the assumptions, or you know, just just deciding to go outside of the box a little bit. You know, there's there's it's it's kind of a a trade off. There's a there's a risk to doing something differently that it's it, that it won't work. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that the reason that people do things the way they do is for a reason, because you know other people have tried this other thing as well, and that didn't work. And so, so you're, you know, but on the other hand, if you do do something different, then that opens up opportunities to see something that, that people haven't seen before. So, for example, the switch from tungsten and glass microelectrodes that I mentioned earlier to wire electrodes um, enabled new types of recordings to be made. But you know that that. It wasn't just a matter of, oh, let's try this different thing. Oh, it works. I mean, it took months and years of getting it to work um, because it's, it requires different, um, a different approach and you know, you've know you got different technical problems that you need to solve, like how are you going to get the connection to the recording apparatus if the animal's moving around and how do you move the electrodes through the brain if it's not anesthetized and, and immobilized and, and so on and so on. And that requires the development of microdrive technology. So one of the big things that John O'Keefe did with his, um, he had this very talented technician, Alan Ainsworth, who developed a, a technology for moving electrodes through the brain. Um, so that opened up this opportunity. So it wasn't a simple thing and it required a lot of persistence and a lot of perseverance and um, resources and also the belief that that was going to pay off in the end. Um, and so, you know, it looks, these new discoveries, they, they look like they just happened, but really they're built on the back of a lot of groundwork. And the other thing is that we tend to attribute discoveries to individuals, but when you know the backstory, so, you know, we've attributed play cells to O'Keefe and grid cells to, to the Moser lab and, and so on. Um, but when you know the backstory, you realize that really there's a, a huge number of people were involved. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, I think of it sometimes as like conquering Everest. You know, it wasn't one person that first conquered Everest, actually. It was many, many people, including a team of Sherpas um, who helped those climbers get there. And there's, you know, one or a couple, in the case of Everest, there was, there was a couple who, who, who claimed it together. But actually, it wasn't just those two people either. It was, you know, a whole huge community that made that possible. And science is exactly the same. And one of the problems I think we have with this awarding of prizes is that you single out some lucky people who got to be the one <laughs> that got yeah. boosted above the above the threshold. 
Um, but um, what happens to the others? How do you recognize them? So I think it's important when you tell the stories to, to also look at the backstory. And often that's really interesting. And, and it's more interesting than the life story of one person is, is the life stories of all of the people um, that enabled those discoveries. And so I think the history of science, science historians and um, popularizers of science are incredibly important to the whole enterprise. And that's why I actually like to give up time to c public communication of science, you know, how it all works. And um, I like to do, do things like this, this podcast and lectures and tell people about the, the backstory because it's, um, you know, it reveals the... It also makes it, apart from showing the contributions of the, you know, all the other people apart from like the three or four or whatever, I think it also shows in some way not... I mean, not only the contribution of others, but also often how special the contribution of those people who did make it are. Like that they did, you know, as you said, like the Morsas didn't just have this one paper where they found the grid cells. They had also all this other stuff characterizing it. And they, you know, they did do something differently when they... Yeah, yeah. But also, you know, they were able to um, attract exceptionally talented researchers. So Mariana Fernan, Torkel Hafting, for example, the people who made the discovery... Um, you know, they were attracted to the Moser lab because they knew that there was an excellent lab, but also it was an excellent lab because it had people like that in there. And I think we need to remember that as well, that, um, that it's, that these things kind of build on each other and we've got to not forget, you know, um, particularly, I think we need to not forget those two individuals because, um, they didn't get the Nobel prize. Um, but technically speaking, they, they made the discovery, um, but the, you know, so the prize really, if it was up to me, I would award the prize to a discovery. So the discovery of grid cells, <laughs> and then, um, or, or the you know the discovery of of whatever um, relativity or something like that. Um, because also, you know, Einstein gets credited with relativity, but if you look at um, how Einstein um, came up with that, again, you see that there's a whole bunch of other people involved as well, and he couldn't have done it without them. And so, if we awarded the prize to the discovery then um, everybody involved in that discovery could feel part of that. Yeah. Um, but of course, it's not up to, to me. <laughs> Nobel, it was up to Alfred Nobel who specified the prize. But I would like to see, you know, discoveries get prizes. But isn't that kind of, I mean, so I agree, like the, 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 especially in the popular press and that kind of stuff, the focus is always on the individual who made a contribution. But I think as soon as you know a bit about this whole thing and i think it's addressed quite a lot these days that prizes are given to one person rather even though lots of people contribute to it but i feel like it is kind of, like i don't know my understanding of these kind of prizes especially the prize is kind of that it is that like it's you're kind of awarding the discovery and symbolically some people stand in for that yes um, i mean sometimes it yeah so i feel i don't know i feel like that to me at least that kind of is in it but i yeah, I understand that often it's just this person won the Nobel prize because of this experiment end of story um, yes I, I i sort of agree i think the the nobel prize it sort of personalizes the discovery as well and it and it does acknowledge yeah, the extreme yeah. talent i mean you know of course the people who win nobel prizes um are exceptional scientists in their field or you know occasionally they're just exceptionally lucky but usually they're exceptionally yeah. talented and lucky, you know, both. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Together. You need both. Um, the problem is, though, that, you know, history then, um, you know, because history is, is a huge kind of diffuser, we lose all of the detail um, and we re only remember the pinnacles. Um, and then all the other people eventually get forgotten. Um, and one of the things that we're starting to realize now is that um, particular um, groups of people are more likely to get forgotten. So women, for example, and other minoritized groups who um, turn out, when you look at the history, to have been incredibly important, but um, because of human nature, didn't get the prize. You know, uh, so that, so you have to sort of think: well, how do we, how do we, how do we kind of um, fairly attribute credit? Um, and really, the scientific enterprise is such a community thing and also i suppose another another issue is that by awarding prizes to individuals we convey the impression to the public that individuals and individual discoveries are what science is all about 
And so the public will often read a newspaper article that says, you know, scientists have discovered X, when really what that means is a scientific group published a paper about X, <laughs> but lots of other papers didn't find X. And we're not sure whether X is a thing, and it's going to require a lot more work to find out whether X is a thing. But you know, Cancer isn't the, cured yet. Yeah, yeah the, pub, the public view of science is that science is made by individual discoveries, and, and we feed into that with our um, awarding of prizes. So I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of, again, I'm, I'm very split. It's that same thing about how do you... Although it seems to me that from what you said earlier, it does seem like John O'Keefe was someone who kind of uh, went against the grain and... They, it does, from at least from the from what I I mean I pretty much the history mainly know what you just told me <laughs> um, <laughs> of John O'Keefe's work in particular. I mean, it seems to me there that he was it wasn't lots of people working on the same thing, and it was obvious that one person was going to get there eventually. Um, it, you see what I mean? Like it sounds like he kind of maybe was one of those figures who advanced the field quite a bit by himself. Yeah, I I think. So, I mean, the question is, you know, would place cells have been discovered anyway? And I think they probably would have been. So, so Jim Ronk, who I've mentioned as, as um, developing the, um, you know, the, the flexible microwire technology, he was pretty close to, to finding them because he was also applying this technique that he had, he had developed um, to the hippocampus. And if you read his papers from around that time, he was um, very carefully trying to characterize um, what those neurons would respond to, um, but he didn't. He didn't recognise that place was what they um, were responding to. And the question is, would he have done had he had a bit more time? Um, maybe, and maybe he would, and maybe he wouldn't. So it's hard to know. Yeah. He did then discover head direction cells, and you know, he so he um, is credited with that work, even though he didn't. Didn't he wasn't the first author on the first head direction cell paper? He was the okay, one, uh, isn't it? Uh, I remember one is Tauber because it's pigeon in German, um, <laughs> like just literally, oh, right, so right. means pigeon, yeah. Um, but who are the other two? There's always, wasn't it three authors or something? Um, uh, gosh, no, I, I think, um, John Kuby might have been one of the others, yeah, and Bob Muller. Um, like so yeah, there were several authors, um. But, you know, Ronk was the person who first reported the observation in 1984. Oh, okay, and then yeah, Tauby that. was the postdoc who um, was sort of given the head, head direction cell project, you know, find, find out what these cells do. And, um, so he was the first author on that paper in 1990. And that's a tremendously important discovery as well. Um, and Tauby then went on and did an amazing job of characterizing um, many of the, you know, the sort of sensory correlates of head direction cells and um, he's been very influential for me because he was the first person who started to ask the question about the three-dimensional um, properties of these neurons. So yeah, so getting back to um, whether people who can be credited with this discovery, it's, it's sort of hard to, to know because we haven't got the control and condition of yeah. not having that person make that, that discovery. But um, yeah, no, I think it does, it is, it is nice to, to recognise the tremendous um, important contribution. And the other thing is um, that, that that just the hope that you might be one of those people. The nice thing about science, which makes it unlike other competitive fields like athletics, you know, if you are not an Olympic athlete, you know that you'll never win an Olympic <laughs> yeah. gold medal. Whereas there's always a hope in every scientist that you might win a Nobel Prize because you might Maybe one get day. lucky. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you know? exactly. Um, so so that I think that that's quite a nice sort of thing as well. And to, yeah, I think as long as you're aware that it's a bit of a lottery, then yeah, it's fine. Yeah. It's yeah, it's not deterministic. It's probabilistic, yeah. and yeah, then I think it can be a kind of nice game almost. Uh, yeah, and it brings great joy to the field. So the you know the the place cell grid cell Nobel Prize really invigorated. I mean, we were just everybody in the field was thrilled, or almost everybody. I'm sure one or two people maybe weren't, but. <laughs> Um, you know, basically, it was just super nice to have that um, acknowledged as an as an important thing in, in bioscience. Yeah, I mean, that's also um, what I felt because you know I came from psychology and knew a little bit about cognitive neuroscience from the kind of stuff they tell you in a basic psychology bachelor's in the UK. But then I, when I was at UCL and did Neil Burgess and Casper Barry's module on, I mean, it's called neurocomputation, but it was effectively 
half of it was on spatial navigation as an example of that. And, you know, when then John and O'Keefe won the Nobel Prize like three, four weeks into that module, it was like, oh, what we're doing is really important. <laughs> like, yeah. I really, I, I liked it before, but like, it's like actually like, yeah, you get this kind of external validation. Of, yeah. Like this stuff is actually very important. What, you, what they're teaching you right now. Yeah. Um, oh, my, um, my cat has just walked in to say hello. Uh, hello, cat. <laughs> <laughs> hello, cat. He's hoping I'll give him a treat. Well, I mean, if you have one, feel free. <laughs> um, yeah, do you mind? I'll, I'll yeah, be right sure. there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. I edit that bit out. <laughs> <laughs> I should put like some elevator music or something. Over it. <laughs> like, Please stand well, by. Look at Jeffrey. Give me a cat. <laughs> yeah. um, so I wanted to talk about the... 3D stuff in a second, but before we do that, I just wanted to like kind of finish off a little bit the um, your PhD postdoc experience with Richard Morris and John O'Keefe. I was just curious. I mean, they both have, as you said, uh, achieved quite a lot. Um, is there and you worked, you know, for I guess the first several years of your research career in their labs. So I'm assuming they were quite influential in how you do research. Um, is there anything in particular you kind of learned from them or that you realize now that oh i'm doing it the way they're doing it or yeah pr probably or well certainly i guess something i learned from both of them um particularly richard is is experimental design so he he is very good at um at really crystallizing a hypothesis and figuring out how to how to test it with all of the controls that you need to rule out the other possible explanations for things. And I sort of learned a lot just from designing experiments with him and seeing how he, he does it that I think has influenced me a lot. Um, although, you know, often the work that I do is a bit more exploratory. It's, it's a bit more, you know, just what happens in this situation. <laughs> um, but, you know, when I'm reviewing papers or if I'm um, really wanting to kind of nail an observation it's it's always in the back of my mind you know what are all the various confounding factors and how do i control for those and so on and then um from john i mean i learned a lot from john and i guess one thing is so he's he's quite sort of ethologically minded so thinking about what are these neurons doing for the animal given the normal life that the animal lives and you know how do you get an animal to to express its natural behaviors so that we can, you know, study these neurons doing what they do. Um, and I think I've taken that with me as well. I tend to think about place cells almost almost doing sort of psychological experiments. You know, what can the what can yeah, the animal see? Yeah. What's it thinking about? Um, is it thinking about what you think it's thinking about? <laughs> Might it be doing something else? Is it distracted? Is it, you know, what's its attention focused on? And all of this kind of stuff. So, so you know, thinking of these things as part of a system um, in an animal that's in a real world. And I, I guess that may be what's sort of partly motivated my studies of complex space and sort of more naturalistic space, um, trying to, um, on the one hand, keep everything well enough controlled so that we can answer meaningful questions, but also um, looking at the world as um, less stereotyped than, than the typical laboratory space. Yeah, I think it's really easy to get lost in your task, right? And always forget, like, what you're doing this to study some actual behavior yeah, in yeah. the real world. Yeah, I think um, Richard Morris was also very much like that, sort of um, finding laboratory versions of real world problems that, that animals have to solve. I mean, not everybody is like that. Like, there's a lot of research involves very artificial tasks, you know, like lever pressing tasks for rats and so on. Things that are kind of practically easy to implement in the lab, but it's sort of hard to think. Well, when would an animal actually do this in in, in real life? You know. Um. So yeah. So. Okay, that's true. Um, okay, so as I said, I'd like to talk about your you have two recent papers on well it turns out more than two papers but there's two papers uh, that i've read about <laughs> um, spatial navigation in three dimensions um one thing that really surprised me is that so i don't know so when i took a few courses that related to these things i always wondered like what would happen in 3d and 
somehow I seem to have missed that there is already a literature on this. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I read your, somehow I thought, I don't know, maybe I thought I'd look this up and couldn't find anything, but just hadn't looked it up or something. But when I read, so you have these two um, papers that I think one was published in Nature Communications last year and the other came out as a preprint. Again, those will be in the description, the references. When I read those papers, I only realized just how much stuff, and you in particular, had done on three-dimensional work. Uh, rather, seeing like whether these these phenomena of play cells and grid cells that we, the vast majority of studies observe in 2D, whether they also apply in 3D. Um, yeah, I just hadn't been aware that that already existed. Um, could you maybe briefly summarize kind of the, what, you found in those papers and kind of or maybe like what existed before and kind of what you added to that with these papers sure so i mean the basic question is you know when when you record an animal walking around on a flat environment you get these regions where the place cells and grid cells um, fire and when the animal faces in a particular direction you know head direction cell will fire and so on so we've we've kind of studied what what I think of as a flat map. So the animal is just walking around a flat surface and we can see these sort of regions which we think are what we call a cognitive map. And so the question is, if the animal isn't walking around on the flat, what happens to the map? Um, because most environments aren't perfectly flat. You know, very few animals live in a completely flat world. And there are sort of various possibilities. One is that the that the map follows the surface of the environment. So if you're walking up and down hills, you know, in, into valleys and so on, that, that the map just kind of follows the surface. Um, or the other possibility is that the map is actually kind of three-dimensional in as if you could move through volumetric space. So imagine that you could fly or swim and you could, you could therefore go in any direction you wanted. So you could think of the map as filling this volume and so if an animal was able to explore that space, you might imagine that the place where a place cell would fire, so the place field, might be a volumetric structure, like a, a globule in space, if you like. <laughs> and we're kind of cutting through this globule when the animal is walking around on the flat. But if the animal could move around in three-dimensional space, maybe we'd see this globular um, kind of region. Uh, and similarly with the grid cells, we know that on the flat the cells have this very regular um, arrangement of firing fields. If the animal could move through volumetric space, would we see that this arrangement, this, this regular arrangement, continued into the vertical um, dimension? So would there be a, a lattice of grid fields, each one like a tiny little sphere, and all kind of stacked together? So, so I started asking that question a long time ago by creating an apparatus that would would let animals climb so they could get off the horizontal plane and they could you know climb into vertical space but we hadn't yet figured out how to get rats to move through a volume so it was just let's get them to walk around in a sort of vertical plane and see what happens and so we we created this thing called the pegboard which is like a climbing wall for rats it's it's a, a flat surface with pegs sticking out of it and the rats can climb over these pegs um so they can get off the ground and the question is you know if a place cell has a place field on the ground if the rat goes above the ground will that place field still be there like still, will it still have the same horizontal coordinates even though the rat is now above the ground and similarly with the grid cells so if if there's a grid pattern on the floor if the rat can be above the floor will that pattern um, continue and what we found is that the grid cells sorry the place cells seem to they they do have firing regions that seem to extend vertically as well as horizontally and they're a little bit elongated vertically so they're a bit longer in the vertical dimension than they are so they're, they're taller than they are wide as it were very slightly um, but nevertheless they do have this kind of circumscribed shape so it looks like the place cells are tracking how high the rat has gone as it's walking around on this pegboard but the grid cells don't seem to track height so they seem to just fire so if there was a place on the floor where the grid cell would fire it would fire um, at every height above that location, provided the rat remained in that location. And similarly, if there was a place on the floor that the cell was silent, because it was between two place fields, um, two grid fields, um, it would continue to be silent no matter how high the rat was. So the rat wasn't going in and out of grid fields as, as it got higher and higher and higher. So that, that made us think maybe this map is um, 
Well, A, it's different for grid cells and place cells. So the place cells seem to be able to track height and the grid cells aren't. So that was slightly surprising. And also the grid cells don't seem to be tracking distance moved in vertical space. They're only tracking it in horizontal. But we also thought, well, the pegboard is a slightly strange arrangement because although the animal is in vertical space, it's it's still oriented horizontally because it's standing on the pegs. So its body is still horizontal, still horizontally aligned, even though the rad as a whole is, is up above the ground now. So maybe the grid cells are caring about the location of the um, plane of the body. And because it's still oriented horizontally, they are acting as if the rat's on a horizontal surface and they're, and they're not caring about how high, high it goes. So what would happen if the rat was actually or- oriented parallel to the wall instead of standing on these pegs? So I had a PhD student, Giulio Casali, who, who did this experiment. And what he did was he put chicken wire all over a wall and chicken wire all over the floor as well. And he got rats to kind of wander around um, either on the floor or on the wall. So when they were on the floor, the body was oriented horizontally. And when the rat kind of went over to the wall and climbed onto the wall, now its body was oriented vertically. And what he found was that now that the rat's body is oriented vertically, as it moves over that wall, we see that grid cells are producing firing fields that are circular, just like, like the, in the same way that they're circular on the floor, except that they're bigger and there are fewer of them, and they're more widely spaced. So it's almost as if there's a, a there's trying to be a grid pattern on the wall, but it's very expanded. So the fields have gotten bigger, and the spaces between the fields have gotten bigger. Um, and that means you can't fit very many of these fields on a wall, so there's maybe only one or two. So the same grid cell will produce a nice tight pattern with lots of fields on the floor, and a much bigger pattern with bigger, fewer fields on the, on the wall. So just to interrupt here briefly, isn't, if I remember correctly, with grid cells, you can't remember what paper that is from the Moser lab anymore, but you, uh, if you move along one direction in the entorhinal cortex, you, they have different scalings of uh, how big the grid patterns are. Right? That's right. Um, is it possible that you happened, when you were in the vertical dimension, is it possible that you were just recording from grid cells that happen to have a large scaling? Or did you like really vary this? And, I mean, yeah. yeah, no, so we would re- record from the exact same cell on the, oh, I say we, I, I see, mean Julio. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Julio, this was a very difficult experiment to run. Um, so he would be recording um, the exact same cell on the floor and then tracking it as it moved onto the wall. So this same cell could express a tight grid in one setting and a large grid in the other. Um, but you're right. There, there is also this other um, aspect of grid cells that I that I didn't mention, and you're you're right to remind me to mention, which is that um, in different parts of entorhinal cortex, the scales of these things are different. So if you're right at the top of the brain, the scale of the grids is quite small. So the firing fields might be let's say 30 centimeters apart, so quite close together. Whereas if you go down much deeper, then the scale gets much larger. So the fields get larger, and the spacings between the fields get correspondingly larger as well. So the whole grid just gets much more expanded. So yes, there are these cells that have these different intrinsic scales, but also we see that that this one cell can express different scales depending on the setting that it's in. And Julio did some analysis of some other signals in the entorhinal cortex, the speed signals that seem to be tracking how fast the animal is moving. And what he found was that these speed signals seem to be quite reduced. So it's as if the rat could be moving at the same speed, or let's say moving at a given speed, and if it's on the floor, um, the speed cell will respond in a particular way, but if it's on the wall, that same speed cell will respond much less. It's as if that speed cell is not correctly tracking the speed. It thinks that the rat's moving much slower than it is, and so therefore everything is much bigger. It takes, it takes for the same amount of time it, it take, it's, it's taken sorry because because the cell is treating the rat as moving slower. It takes longer for it to get from one side of a grid field to the other. If you see what I mean, and so it's got it's gone a bigger distance. So so that was Julio's explanation for why these these fields are expanded. So that was different from what we saw on the pegboard, and we thought, well, that's sort of um, interesting. So does that mean that the animals not that the grid cells aren't really tracking the space um, above the rat? back. <laughs> so um, so it's tracking 
the surface that the animal is on, and it's not interested in movement of the rat that's orthogonal, so perpendicular to that, to that surface. So then we thought, well, what would happen if the animal could move around volume, actually move freely in all three dimensions? So Roddy Greaves came to my lab at that point, and he, um, he took up a postdoc with me and set about trying to solve this technical problem. So this is one of these things that we mentioned, that it's a natural extension, and you know, it's sort of doing something different from what anyone has done before, but it requires an enormous amount of work to make it happen. So he, um, he set about figuring out how to record wirelessly and how to track in three dimensions. So you need multiple cameras to be able to pinpoint the location of the animal in three dimensions. It's really a tr very tricky technical problem. Um, and he spent a couple of years solving it and then a couple of years recording place cells and grid cells. And he found that, that the place cells would produce globular place fields in this volumetric space. So as if the, the, so the, the region where the cell would become activated, if you map out that region, it forms a three-dimensional form, a globule. If you, you know, what's technically called a spheroid, I think, or something. But I think of it as globule. <laughs> <laughs> um, and these globules per permeate that volumetric space. And we were quite pleased to see that pattern because it was similar to a pattern that um, Nakamulanovsky's group had reported in bats. So in, in their um, animals, these because they're bats, they can fly in three dimensions. And Michael Yartsev, who was a PhD student in, in Nakam's lab, had really beautifully shown that there would be these three-dimensional place fields distributed throughout this um, volumetric space. And we saw almost exactly the same pattern in the rats. So even though rats and bats are um, kind of different in how they normally explore space, their place cells seem to encode it in a very similar way, which was interesting. And then the question is, what would the grid cells do? And we were still, still at the stage thinking that the grid cells are how the place cells are able to track the distances and therefore to know where to position their, their firing fields. So we thought that we might see um, a lattice in three-dimensional space, so a three-dimensional grid where the symmetry of the pattern is maintained, the regularity, you know, the repeating pattern is maintained in the vertical dimension as well as in the horizontal dimension. And um, Nakam Olonofsky's group, meanwhile, have been doing um, a similar experiment in their bats. So um, PhD student, I think, I think either a PhD student or a postdoc, Gili Guinnesson in his lab, had solved this also technically amazingly tricky problem of how to record in flying bats. <laughs> so really, you know, incredible work has gone into, into this seemingly simple experiment. And she had found, and they've not published this yet, but they've published several abstracts and, and shown this data at several conferences now, and we've had a talk to them about it. And, um, and they're seeing that, um, that the grid cells are forming... Uh, globules, so so three-dimensional firing fields that are distributed throughout the space, but in a non-regular way. So they have the same blobby appearance that we see on a horizontal surface, but um, it's not regular in the way that we see on a horizontal surface. Um, and then Roddy, um, in my lab, um, got the data from our rats, and we saw something that's pretty similar, except with, with one difference, which we're trying to understand at the moment. Uh, so he, again, has seen blobbiness of the firing fields of these cells, uh, and it's distributed evenly throughout the volume, but so not, in, um, not, not in, a, in any kind of columnar arrangement. So clearly the cells are able to track vertical distance, but um, it's not in a regular way. Now, the difference between um, what the Ulanovsky group have seen and what um, we've seen is that they, when they look at the statistics of the distribution of these firing fields, they see that although the distribution is irregular, the spacing is more regular than you would expect if it was random. So they see these more um, stereotyped distances. So there's an over-representation of a particular distance for a just particular cell. Just not as precisely? Or? It's, it's just not precise enough to, to generate a regular grid, but it's there in the statistics. We have looked carefully at the statistics of our firing fields, and we don't see that in rats. And so we're trying to figure out, is that because we've just not used the same statistics, although we've, we've tried to do the same type of analysis? Is it that rats and bats are fundamentally different? That seems unlikely to me. What seems most likely to me is that there's a difference that's been imposed by the fact that the, the bats can smoothly and uninterruptedly traverse their environment in any direction – 
whereas our rats are constrained to the directions that are orthogonal to the axes of the maze because they're climbing through this um, lattice like maze so that so they have to they, they can only go in certain directions they can't go diagonally very easily for example so i think that that constraint is enough to disrupt the spacing that's my working hypothesis but we're trying to work our way through that at the moment with the help of some kindly anonymous reviewers <laughs> so we'll have to see what um what emerges from that story um but yeah, so so putting that together with the other results that we got, it looks like the exact nature of the firing fields, so the distribution of firing in different environments, depends on the type of environment and the constraints that are placed on the animal's movements. So on the pegboard, we saw that the grid cells didn't track height, but in the lattice, we're seeing that they are tracking height. So there's something different about those two environments, and it may be to do with the ability of rats to move uninterruptedly in vertical dimension or something. I, I don't know exactly what it is. There's a lot of work to find out exactly what it is. But it certainly looks like the um, the map is... It, so as I think of it, it's not out there in the world and, and the animals are moving through it. <laughs> the map is kind of constructed on the fly as a function of what the animal can see and what it's able to do um, and which way it thinks it's facing and, and all of this type of stuff, how fast it's able to move and whether it's good and good... Uh, speed information or if that's been disrupted and so on. So it's a variety, compl complicated web of different types of input and a variety of different maps for different settings. Yeah, I, I think I have a few questions here. Um, maybe I'll start with the smaller ones. One is just, uh, you said that it was quite a technical challenge to record in 3D. Khan, couldn't you just have used the technology that they developed in BATS a few years ago? And use it in rats, or just just fundamentally not work. Yeah, well, that's I mean that's kind of what we did. So um, so it involves getting wireless telemetry going um, and multiple cameras. So, so, it so was we did on the, same. the same thing. But okay. you know the the idea is not novel, but the implementation in a given lab um, it takes a lot of work to get it um, to work. Wireless, wireless telemetry is not as easy as it sounds because. The, um, the signals reflect off anything sort of metal. So you're trying to transmit with a little radio transmitter these electrical signals, um, but they reflect off anything metal. And, of course, we use metal to shield our environment so that we're not picking up extraneous okay. electrical noise. Yeah. So, that, so there's all sorts of technical challenges. And, and you know, if, the, if the animal gets too far away from the um, receiver, then the signal drops out. And, and um, in a... In a lattice environment, if you're trying to track the LEDs on the head of the rat, um, because you've got physical struts that are creating the lattice that shield, that that blocks off the the light, so you need lots of cameras, and you know then you need to stitch that all together and, and software and, and stuff like that. So it's um, it's a non-trivial thing to yeah, get okay, going. Okay. Um, the other question is: you mentioned earlier that both Richard and John were big on thinking about what kind of things the animals will naturally do. Now, how three-dimensional are rats in their normal lives? I mean, it seems to me they're quite a bit more three-dimensional than humans, for example. I mean, apart from like stairs or ladders, we pretty much are two-dimensional. And uh, I mean, I, I don't know much about, I mean, I, we had hamsters when I grew up. So <laughs> I know that hamsters, like, they always like climbing and on the ceiling and everything, right? Um, if you're in their cage, but um, yeah, I'm just curious, like how natural of a behavior is this kind of climbing up or through things? Or yeah, that, that, that's a good question, and, and we we had the same question because we thought of rats as um, animals that lumber around on the ground because that's all we'd ever seen in the lab. So I I actually um, went to our home office. So in this country, we have like all animal research is overseen by um, a government body called the Home Office. Um, which you know makes sure that the ethical um, procedures are, are all tightly adhered to and so on. And they have lots of experts that they consult on various things. And so I went to them and said, you know, if I wanted to study a, um, a, a small mammal that would be tractable in the lab that's got a three-dimensional ecology, um, what would be a good um, species to study? And they went away and came back and said, we think um, the rat. <laughs> um, and it turns out that actually rats have a very three-dimensional ecology. So they live in these three-dimensional burrow systems. But also... Um, in the wild, they do a lot of climbing. And, and in fact, I discovered this firsthand when we moved into this house that we, we live in currently. And we had this big apple tree in the backyard. And I looked out the window one day just after we'd moved in and could see all this movement. And I realized that 
it was teeming with rats. Like there were several of them, three or four of them. <laughs> and it turned out that our next door neighbours had a colony living under their lawn. And when rat colonies get too overpopulated, the, the rats that are the, at the bottom of the hierarchy, so the ones that get bullied, yeah. um, will violate their normal nocturnal instincts and they'll come out during the day. And so we had rats coming out into our garden and, and climbing up the tree and um, you know fighting with squirrels and all sorts of entertaining things. And, and, and so just watching them, they, they scuttled around the branches very, very happily. So when we came to recording um, in our three-dimensional environments, we imported into the lab a huge um, parrot cage. So it's a big aviary that, that people use to keep parrots in. So that's two meters long by a meter and a half wide by I think a meter and a half or two meters high. That's the one you've got on YouTube, right? Quite large. Uh, Yes. So it's it's very large and we filled it with ladders and ropes and you know little platforms that they could climb on and um, and they were really happy to explore this. They're very agile and they spend a lot of time climbing and you know, we'd find them all piled up in a big pile asleep on one of the platforms, for example. Um, They're very comfortable climbing. Um, And so that meant that they were quite comfortable in our apparatus and that they had had plenty of opportunity to form a 3D map in their brains, if if that's what they do. Um, so we're pretty sure that we are studying something that's that's reasonably ethologically sort of plausible. I mean, obviously there are differences. So you know, as with uh, foraging on a um, flat surface, a, a rat wouldn't normally evenly forage through a lattice, for example. But they might well explore a tree and you know, nibble on the apples or the walnuts or something like that. Um, so I think it's not completely unnatural. Okay. I was lucky then that they said rats are not like some, some animal that's never been used for spatial navigation. We, I mean, I mean we did just... also think about squirrels because there is a bit known about squirrel brain. But the problem is, you know, the thing with rats is that they've been bred for many, many generations to be tame and um, docile and not very anxious Whereas if you use wild animals, they're extremely anxious all the time because you put them in a lab and they're in this constant terror um, state. It's, it's not good for their welfare and it's not easy to work with them. And also they're very diseased. It's almost impossible to eradicate disease, whereas um, laboratory bred animals are completely disease-free. So you know the, the rat turned out to be um, great for our purposes. The only uh, problem we're having with them is that now we're starting to want to get a little bit more deep into some of these questions and look at what happens, for example, if they go upside down. And rats are really not very happy upside down um, they, because they are having to hang on with their claws and th- they find that really difficult. So yeah, they, one thing I find interesting in the video you posted on YouTube is that whenever they were on the wall of the chicken wire, they always went down. They didn't seem, maybe that was a coincidence, but when I saw it, it didn't seem like they were comfortable like claw, like using their claws to climb up the chicken wire. I don't know, maybe that was coincidence, but... Um, that uh, that might have been coincidence. So, so climbing up, they're not too bad. Climbing down, we find they tend to prefer to kind of come down backwards and sideways, so they crab down. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, they yeah. can kind of see where they're going, but also they're... They're still the right way around for their claws. They don't like to be nose down. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's really been quite tricky. Um, and in fact, if they go nose down, they're having to just hang on with their hind feet. They, they face their hind feet back the other way so that they can use their claws like hooks uh-huh, as well. Okay. Mice, on the other hand, are, are really happy in, in any direction because they're so lightweight. So we are in the process of thinking about how to import some of our methods to mice, but then then you have a whole bunch of other problems, like they are so small that they don't carry a wireless device very easily. So so there's a few technical challenges to solve there as well. So depending on the question, you know, you may need to use one species or another or one uh, apparatus or another. It's all quite challenging. Are there other three-dimensional mammals other than bats? Like, I'm just trying to think like, of any mammal that is more... I don't know, three-dimensional than a hamster or something, or a mouse. Yeah, squirrels are probably about as three-dimensional as it gets, and chipmunks and things like that, they are. They, they zoom what around. flying squirrels? Um, flying squirrels, yeah, possibly. Yeah, because they, they fly. <laughs> yeah, or, um, I mean, but they glide, really. Yeah, they glide, as I said. They don't really fly. They, they fall slowly. I mean, slowly. Bats, bats are probably, if you want something that's truly volumetric, I think bats are probably, yeah. probably your best bet. Um, and indeed, the work that Nakamononovsky's group has done on three-dimensional encoding in, in bats is 
just spectacular. It's it's yeah. very beautiful. So. Yeah. Um, I have one broader question about the amounts of dimensions that grid cells and play cells encode. Um, so, I mean, you've shown that they, I, mean, well, I guess we also knew this from BATS, but, you know, your work has shown that, you know, three dimensions seems to work. Um, a One thing I'm curious about that I'm sure other people are also curious about is kind of what are the limits in terms of how many dimensions this hippocampal formation can track. Yeah, I'm just curious what your opinion is on that. Or <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question that um, people are starting to to address experimentally now. So, I mean, beyond the three spatial dimensions, you can think of other stimuli as also having dimensions, if you like. So for us, for example, colour, we might also have colour, a colour dimension from green through to red or something like that. So if you had an environment that had three spatial dimensions and one colour dimension, like let's say you could turn a dial and you could make your room move smoothly between green and red, and when it was green you got one particular thing, and um, if it was red you got a different particular thing, and, and if it was green you got one type of reward in one part of the three-dimensional space, and if it was red it was another type of reward in another type of you know part of the space, and so on and so on. So... Um, and and so you could take that further and say, well, not just color, but um, all sorts of dimensions. What you know, what they call sort of cognitive um, dimensions. Might it be that the hippocampal system has this more general purpose function um, in pinpointing where you are in a multi-dimensional space? And I don't know what I think about that. It's certainly the case that people have tried manipulating um, non-spatial dimensions smoothly while place cells are recorded and they find that there are regions within that um, that stimulus dimension where something that for all intents and purposes looks like a place cell will become active within a bounded space. So for example, Aronoff and Tank did an experiment where they manipulated an auditory tone and a, and a, a rat could kind of, as it were, navigate its way through this auditory space and there would be places within the space where a hippocampal neuron would become active. So that's quite, that's quite, those types of findings are quite tantalizing. Um, so the question is, is this a really weird and unnatural stimulus that the brain has decided to represent using its spatial module because it doesn't know what else to do? <laughs> or is, it, is this really the fact that space is just one form of a multi-multi-dimensional um, processing capability? And three of those dimensions are used to represent three spatial dimensions, but there's all sorts of other things that could also be represented. And, you know, time, for example. Um, and indeed, if you look at time, if you set up your experiment so that time is a relevant dimension, um, then place cells start to show what they call time fields in that space. So, I mean, I, I don't know what, what I think. I think it's really intriguing. I think it's the next big question to answer. Very intriguing um, speculations about um, these higher dimensional spaces, and in humans, maybe um, that capability has been co-opted to allow us the very sophisticated um, cognitive capabilities that that we have. Yeah, I mean that's that's the the perspective from which I'm asking. So my stuff is in humans, and I mean as 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 interesting as the whole spatial navigation literature is. In some sense, I don't care too much about how people get from A to B, um, but more about like all other things that you could represent. In well, that that uh, that have a dimensionality to it, um, and or a continuous um, quality to it, and so interesting. So, so tell me more. So, <laughs> are you able to reveal what your experiment? Well, I'm not doing it directly. No, it's just. Oh, okay. I mean, this is something. Um, I mean, there are in humans. There are quite a few studies where they. I mean, Tim Barron's has been doing. Most of that's or a lot of the most famous stuff there. Um, and I think my point is more that I'm not working on that directly right now. It's more this is just something I'm curious about. Like, I see. Yeah. To what extent is, I mean, number one, can any dimension be encoded in the hippocampal formation? And number two, how many can be tracked at the same time? Mm. So is this, because so far we've only, I don't know what the maximum amount of dimension is anyone has tracked in a is it three? I don't know. Like at the same time. Well, I don't know. I mean, so so there. Are, yeah, I, I I don't know actually. I was going to say that there there are place cells that have a um a place field 
but also if you when it's in the place field if you manipulate some other stimulus you can um, get firing um, within the bounds of that stimulus as well so the cell will only fire if the animal is in that place and experiencing this other stimulus for example but having said that that's been done in two-dimensional spatial environments yeah. so I guess the maximum dimensions are still three. So the question is, could in a three-dimensional environment, could you have a four four-dimensional? Yeah, exactly. Cell? Yeah, and I, I think it's quite possible, quite possible, because you know the hippocampus does do a lot of associating, and place cells do seem to be very interested in tracking movement through some continuum relative to some fixed point. So, um, yeah, I, th I guess we will find out. In future, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Future research. Yeah, um, I, w I have two more points, but I don't think we'll get through it without making this too long. Um, I mean, like one thing I was interested in is, uh, um, so as I read in your, uh, you know, as I read in my email to you, like I'd read Carlo Rovelli's books or one, there's the seven brief, his lessons of in physics, or whatever it's called. And I thought it was really cool. And, um, you know, it's just like a thing I read once. And then for some reason, I saw, you know, K. Jeffrey has a paper with, um, I can't remember which, I think I just the one with Galvelli. And I thought, oh, okay, it's something on entry, whatever. And it took me a while to realize that that's the same person who right. wrote those physics books. <laughs> like I didn't, you know, assume that that was the same person. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I, uh, your trends in neuroscience paper I, I really love these kind of papers that kind of make you think about like the big scale of things oh that's, um, that's good and in a way i'd like to talk about it in depth but i want to read like lots of papers before i do that so <laughs> i'm not capable i'm of writing right now. i'm writing a book on that on that subject so oh, really? maybe when, maybe you can read that <laughs> i'll very yeah. happily read it is there a <laughs> tentative uh, publication date for that or is it um well no um, it's a few it's we we way off yeah be another Sorry? year probably okay yeah probably another year. um but then uh, i'm just curious like how did this cross-disciplinary collaboration get going yeah so this this came about so, sort of by by chance so i was invited to a um a very elite discussion meeting i was very privileged to be invited to this discussion meeting that was organized by yuri buzaki who is um, another luminary in, in my field who, you know, is very interested in um, things like brain oscillations and, and aspects of processing, I guess, that evolve in space and time. So he, he organized this discussion meeting that brought together neuroscientists who work on space and time together with physicists who work on space and time. And we were all closeted in a um, resort in Costa Rica. It was the most amazing um, experience to be in this just stunningly beautiful location with this um, small and you know, extremely knowledgeable set of people. And I'd been really excited to meet the physicists. I mean, I knew most of the neuroscientists. I was happy to meet up with them again. I knew all of the neuroscientists, I think. But I, I hadn't met the physicists, and there were you know people like Sean Carroll and Carla, Carla Rivelli, who I knew because of the um, popular science, but were outside my research area. Um. And I had sort of, I'd been thinking, what am I going to talk about? Um, how could I possibly have anything that's of any interest to any of these amazing people? <laughs> um, and, and my talk was on the third day, so there were three days of talks. And the first day was from the physicists, and they were talking about how they think about space and time, and it was all very relativistic and quantum, and um, to do with you know big picture questions like like entropy and complexity and things that I just find super cool. But, you know, quite a long way removed from what I do in my daily life. And the second day was the neuroscientists, um, w w was neuroscientists, not all of us, you know, because there, some of us were on the third day. And the neuroscientists, you know, explained to the physicists all about grid cells and place cells and memory and, you know, how we all think of this, um, how, how it all works. And it was all, that was all cool as well. And the physicists seemed really interested, but um, it also seemed that there wasn't really a lot of overlap between what the physicists had talked about on day one and the neuroscientists talked about on day two. And also I felt like we'd had an awful lot of grid cells and play cells and very esoteric um, neuroscience on day two. And I just thought, I, I just don't feel this meeting needs more of that because I, I d didn't really have anything much to add other than the stuff I've been doing on three-dimensional 
processing, which is, you know, is not, not uninteresting, but I, I just thought, I sort of wonder if I can make better use of this uh, brief opportunity to talk to these amazing people. <laughs> um, and I, so I, so I turned to thinking about something else that I had been really pondering on a lot, as in ruminating on for the last year or two, which is sort of to do with the climate crisis, which, you know, in 2018 and, and more so in 2019 started to really come to public attention because we had um, this series of freak weather events, super hot summers, wildfires, you know, super freezes, you know, amazing floods, like super extreme heat waves that were killing lots of people in, in tropical regions and so on. A series of calamities. And around about this time, um, environmental activists started to, to get really vocal and say, look, we've got to be doing something. And I was paying a lot of attention. And I, in fact, had joined Extinction Rebellion um, because I felt like they were uh, the biggest opportunity to get the attention of politicians. Nobody else seemed to be succeeding and getting their attention, but these people seemed to be succeeding. And they had a lot of very creative and innovative ideas. So I, I joined them um, and started reading up about the climate crisis and um, really getting quite depressed about the future of humanity, really, <laughs> which seemed to be quite grim. I'm rethinking all my you know, happy optimism about how science is going to take us forward into the, this great, amazing future and thinking, actually, it looks like we might be driving ourselves into extinction. And reading, reading up about um, climate over paleontological time, trying to understand how we got into this situation, and, and just thinking about, you know, really big questions to do with the evolution of the universe and the evolution of life and um, how does this fit in with entropy? Like, how did, how did life come to be? How did we become so complex and so amazing on the one hand and yet be about to drive ourselves into extinction? How, um, how does this all work scientifically and, and how does that fit with entropy? And my understanding of entropy was that really it involves the, um, the constant creation of disorder you know, things break, eggs break, things don't spontaneously form. You know, a house of cards collapses, but houses of cards don't spontaneously form. And, you know, on the one hand. On the other hand, life spontaneously formed. Is life some type of reversal of entropy? And, and I was familiar with um, Schrodinger's work, you know, Schrodinger, the physicist who, who gave us the uncertainty principle and so on. And I was familiar with his, his musings on the subject back in the 1940s, and he had speculated that life... Um, was somehow able to reverse entropy on a local scale. So clearly you can't reverse entropy on a global scale. The laws of thermodynamics are the laws. You know, they can't, they can't, they're immutable. The universe is running out of free energy. But life can sort of temporarily row back on that by borrowing entropy from its surroundings, if you like. It uses energy to kind of reverse entropy. That was my understanding of what Schrodinger was saying. So, so I presented that I decided I was going to present this to these physicists, and I spent the whole night before my talk um, writing this completely new talk from the one I had intended to write. And my heart was in my mouth, and I thought, "Oh God, this could be career-ending." You know, um, <laughs> I've gone way above my pay grade. I'm talking about all of these things I know nothing about. It's not what I was brought here to talk about. This is possibly a terrible mistake, but you know, humanity's headed for extinction, so. I don't care. This is my <laughs> one chance matter. to talk about the climate crisis to all of these people. Um, and so I did. I, you know, I, I, my opening slide was you know, um, the fate of complexity in the universe. Um, and I put this up there and the whole room erupted into laughter and then applause. <laughs> and I thought, oh, ma maybe this is going to work. I, I don't know. Um, but at that stage, I was full of adrenaline. And I thought, I, I don't care. I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do it. And so, so I laid out this whole problem from start to finish. This is how the um, universe unfolded. And, you know, harking back to the talks we'd had on day one and, and um, Sean Carroll talking about complexity and how it at first increases and then decreases and Carlo Rivelli talking about entropy and, and um, so on and time. And this was all woven in. I said, okay, so the physicists have told her this. this. Um, but my, my understanding as a biologist um, is this. And I... And I went through the evolution of life and the evolutionary transitions. And these are the things that I then talked about in this paper that, that you've read, um, how, we, how there seem to be these step changes, these step increases in, in what life can do. How does that fit question with, here, with all of did this? you know all of that already? Because to me, this was like one thing that I found so cool reading this was like, these are all these things I've, I, I mean, and 
you know, I just didn't, I've never read any of those papers or anything like that. Right? Yeah. No, so, so at that stage, I was still of the view that life is a reversal of entropy. Um, that I had the Schrodinger view. Life manages to temporarily reverse entropy by borrowing it from its surroundings. But there was, a, there was an explanatory gap there. Like, how does it do that? What makes it do that? Why does complexity seem to go against entropy and yet c complexity seems to inexorably increase over evolutionary time? Like, we evolved from single-celled or organisms to societies of humans, which, you know, we, are, we like to think we're very complex. And I think we, we are. <laughs> I think it's not unreasonable. Um, but, but, you know, why does complexity seem to evolve in one direction? You know, like, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a gap there. So I laid that out to the audience. I said, what's the gap? Physicists help me out here. Um, and so Carlo Ravelli and Sean um, Carroll, you know, collared me afterwards and said, you know, we, we think we can help. And um, so, so I had some really good conversations with them both separately and also together. And indeed, Sean um, asked me um, onto his podcast su subsequently so that we could have that same conversation in public, as it were, um, and I would articulate the same problem I was having as a biologist and, and he would give the physicist view and it turns out physicists don't really have necessarily all the answers either because when they think about entropy um, they tend to think about an ideal gas in a box and really the, some of the notions do get a bit fuzzy when you're talking about highly complex systems but the second law of thermodynamics nevertheless runs through everything and that is immutable um, but the really big in, um, insight came from Ravelli, and he said, look, you've, you've got it wrong about life reversing entropy. Life is not reversing entropy. Life is an entropic process. The mistake that you've made, that Schrodinger made and lots of other biologists have made, is it equating order with entropy. So while it's true that entropy often creates disorder, entropy can also create order. And then he gave some sort of examples of non-living things where order arises spontaneously. And one of them is if you start off with shaken up oil and vinegar, in a jar, if you let that unfold over time, it will separate out into a more orderly arrangement where the, vinegar, where the um, oil is on the top and the vinegar is on the bottom. So actually you can get order from entropy. Um, and that is able to happen because of things like gravity. So, so when you've got gravity in the mix, if we didn't have gravity, um, you wouldn't get that separation. But because we've got gravity, you do. Um, and slowly, you know, it took me a while to, to work through all of this in my head and, and start to understand it. But slowly it began to make sense that you can get complexity um, because complexity is the formation of order. And it's coming about because of um, entropically driven processes working together with some other processes like, like gravity and so on. So we wrote that. So, so Carlo emailed me and um, another um, colleague, Robert Pollack, and said, Shall we put this all together into a paper? So he wrote that paper that was published um, in this journal, Entropy. Um, and, and so he wrote, he wrote the, the bones of it. And then Robert and I kind of contributed our biological view and made it comprehensible to biologists, <laughs> toned down some of the mathematics and, um, and, and kind of related it to the process of, of evolution and um, genetics and so on. But then I felt there's more to be said on the subject to do with evolutionary transitions in the in the formation of the nervous system. So, so then I wrote the second paper as well. And, so, and sort of outlining those same concepts about how entropy can drive the development of complexity and that can explain why evolution generates more and more complex um, organisms over time, but also how we can uh, sometimes face extinction. So one of the big facets of evolution is constant extinctions. So complexity doesn't always increase. It's a statistical process. and just because we're here doesn't mean we will always be here. And indeed, if you look at the history of things that have evolved in the past, they usually do extinguish themselves. So then, then that, that's a challenge for us as humans. Um, can, we, can we be cleverer than that and stop our own extinction using our highly complex, highly evolved brains? And that's the, that's the big challenge for us now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. As I said, like, I, I just, I really enjoyed reading the paper, but I don't have, um, uh, I think I need to read a lot more until I can make some <laughs> intelligent comments here or <laughs> physically uh, specific questions. But I guess I'll, I'll wait then in part until your book comes out and just read that then. Yes. I mean, if there are things that you're puzzling over, <laughs> then please let me know because, um, if you're puzzling over them, you know, Other so, readers some, might, yeah. if you haven't, 
listen to the podcast with Sean Carroll, um, you could do that, or you could look at the mm -hmm. transcript, which might be a bit quicker, because you may see that a lot of the questions that you have are ones that I had too that I asked him. So the way that we uh, did that podcast is a, is more of a Q and A um, type of um, backwards and forwards. So I interviewed him as much as he interviewed me, which is a slightly unusual format for a podcast. But um, we thought that would be the way to to do that, and I, I think it, it did cover a lot of things that people like me have wondered about. And then if you've got questions beyond that, or indeed um, aspects of that that you thought were particularly salient or aha moments for you, uh, let me know. And I'll, I'll be, yeah, definitely. Um, then I'd know to focus on those in the <laughs> book. <Yeah. laughs> okay, cool. Uh, last, not even question, but maybe more comment. Um, so one thing I also found is that to me, these just the title, right? Transitions in Brain, Evolution, Space, Time, and Entropy. Somehow, I mean, space and time, and brain i can i can very obviously see how that relates to your work but the other thing didn't quite it seemed like kind of left field to me but then the funny thing is one of the first things you mentioned um, when we talked is that you really liked um, information theory um, early on so is that kind of a um almost you pursuing interests almost you had from the very beginning of your that, that's right yeah closing the loop um, that only really occurred to me quite recently, actually, that that's exactly what I've done. I've, I've found my way back to information theory. And I guess, you know, I guess my sort of interest in neural coding and, and how the mind can arise from the brain is sort of related to these bigger questions of how does complexity arrive, arise from nothing, you know. And... They're, they're just the super big questions, and I've always been drawn to the, the really big questions. Um, and now this is trying to just tie it all together, I guess. Yeah. Um, one thing we haven't solved is consciousness. Oh. I think that's possibly for a different <laughs> lifetime. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, whoever solves that one is up for a no I'm not, prize. I'm not sure. I'm not sure there is a solution. I, I sometimes think that the, the question of consciousness is, is like the old question of life. You know, we used to wonder where life came from in living things, and there were these ideas that there was this vital force that flowed through living things. And we don't ask that question anymore because we now can see that life is just a emergent property of very complex systems that have you know movement and so on. I suspect that we will just come to the same conclusion with consciousness that it's sort of not a meaningful question. It's just a naturally emergent property of neurons doing what they do. Yeah. And there isn't a thing to be to be explained, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I mean and I've heard the argument that as not exactly as soon as we had the double helix for DNA, but basically once that came out, the question of like what is life suddenly um, yeah, became less relevant. Um, yeah, yeah, and isn't that isn't that basically what Daniel Dennett is saying? Almost, I can't remember. I've I've done fairly little about consciousness, but I thought he said basically like, um, or his position is that kind of what you just said. Like once you actually find the mechanisms, the whole problem kind of just disappears almost yeah. in front of you. Yeah, yeah. There isn't a ghost in the machine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Good luck to whoever <laughs> wants to solve that one. <laughs> oh. Make it go away. Yeah.